There you go. All right. Good morning, everybody. My name is Lynn Tremonti. I'm with the Ohio Immigrant Alliance, and I'm just so excited to be here. This is the fourth week of our uh, Refugees and Immigrants convening on mobilizing for change and lived experiences in Ohio. Um, what we've been doing over the past few weeks is hearing from immigrants and refugees who live in Ohio about the experiences they've had here, challenges, um, also good things. Um, we've been talking to educators and activists within education about how they are working with immigrant children and all the way up through higher ed uh, to make sure that they and the children of immigrants are getting quality education in Ohio. Um, then we heard from immigration policy experts about the changes that have happened under the current administration, how it has impacted Ohioans. Um, and so that was a great session last week. All of these are recorded if you need to catch up. Um, but this session today is really the culmination of the entire convening because we're taking what we learned and what we talked about in the first three sessions. And then we're hearing about um, how to apply, you know, when we're concerned about an issue, how do we apply it to make change? And we're hearing from some extremely powerful, um, really leading experts on mobilization and change making from across a variety of um, issue areas, um, people that lead at both the national and state and local level. And I think you're gonna really enjoy this panel. Um, what we're gonna do is just start out with some brief introductory remarks from each panelist. I will introduce them and then we'll get into a dynamic sort of Q&A discussion with them. We want you to be part of it too. So you can ask questions, raise your hand or ask questions in the Q&A function. Um, the chat, I believe, is also open so you can, um, you know, engage there. And then also let's push the message out. And so if you could, if you're on Twitter, if you could um, tweet out um, some information or just some quotes or things that you're hearing that really resonate with you, um, we're using the hashtag Immigrant Ohio. And that way we can preserve a record of of our discussion today and what your points of view are on it. So I think that um, with that, I'll start off with the first panelist. We have Anna Babel. She's um, uh, with the Ohio State, I'm uh, oh, sorry, I'm looking for the, the thing. Uh, she's a sociologist and linguistic anthropologist at Ohio State University. Um, she has done a lot of work, both um, helping create um, more support for people that have DACA at Ohio State and also working with a group called Ohio Immigrant Visitation to um, build relationships with immigrants that are in Ohio's immigration jails and let them know that they're not alone and that there's people on the outside who are trying to help them. Um, so Anna, let me ask you, just tell us a little bit about you and your work and what is there a current sort of campaign or mobilization or drive that you're working on right now? Thank you, Lynn. Good morning. Um, and thanks to Lynn, Maria, and to Yolanda for all of the organization. It's been wonderful um, and so well organized. Um, and I'm so excited to have everybody here today um, and to be a part of this conversation. So um, yeah, I'm a professor of Spanish and Portuguese at Ohio State. Um, my research is on language and culture. And I actually have spent about 20 years doing research in Bolivia on language contact between Spanish and Quechua. And um, just given the fact that I live in the US, um, at some point I started getting interested in Spanish and English contact and in Latino communities um, here in the States and started teaching a number of classes um, on um, US Latino languages and communities, um, thinking about Spanish in the US. And those were great classes, they were great experiences. Um, we had so many students at Ohio State that were interested um, I had an opportunity um, to teach a class that's normally taught by my colleague, Dr. Lena Faulis, um, which is heritage speaker instruction. And so we actually had um, a class full of people who grew up speaking Spanish in the home um, and were just looking to get some professional skills. Um, and I guess my life in general has kind of led to more and more integration into the Latino community. Um, and following the 2016 election, I felt really dismayed. Um, about what had happened, um, especially uh, felt betrayed um, by a lot of, I, I guess, by the, by the large demographic um, results. And I kind of looked around me and I said, it's, it's time for me to start giving back. 
Um, I have benefited professionally and personally from my connection to the Latino community. Um, and now I want to turn around and see how I can fix some of the things that I see going wrong in my own community. Um, so at that point, I started working with a couple groups of people who were like me, kind of um, unhappy with the way that popular discourse was going, but didn't know what to do about it. And that developed into um, the Buckeye Dream Ally Program, um, which developed in order to educate students, professors, staff at Ohio State about how they can act to better support um, undocumented students. And that includes DACA students who are probably the most visible, but also people um, who are, have refugee status or who don't have documentation at all. Um, and we've got lots of members of, of our community who are in that situation, but really um, didn't feel uh, comfortable talking about it out loud. Um, and we wanted to change that culture. We wanted to make it okay, and not only okay, but we wanted to say we're proud of our undocumented members of our community and make, make that a public discourse, make that an available um, thing to say. Um, so um, that's, that's kind of what, what I'm doing here on this panel. Um, I, think, um, I think of myself as an educator more than an activist, or I, I am an activist. I think of myself as an educator more than an organizer. And so the project has been um, a project of educating people about how they can themselves engage in, in, in a more activist stance. Thanks, Anna. We look forward to hearing more from you. Next, we're, we will hear from Avery Martins. Um, Avery is somebody that I feel so blessed to have met over the past few months. I have learned so much from them. Avery is with Showing Up for Racial Justice, which is an anti-racist organization that tries to work with white people to get them to understand the um, origins of systemic racism and their role in perpetuating and also breaking the cycle. Um, Avery is also leading coalitions of groups in Ohio that are working to decarcerate our jails and prisons. And um, it's just been very wonderful to, to work with Avery and to sort of see the energy that they bring to this work, which can be very depressing and very difficult, but Avery does it with um, just a lot of class and a lot of style. So Avery, my question for you is, tell us a little bit about your organizations. I know you do work with a couple. And then um, what is the current campaign that you would like to talk about? Awesome. Thank you so much. The feelings are so mutual and it has been a real honor to work with you and all, um, and just to see all of the networks and all the work that you uh, move around the state is incredible. Um, yeah, and I'm so like honored to be part of this panel as well. This is a, a, a like real like star studded panel of, uh, of doers and, and magic makers. So grateful to be here. So yeah, Showing Up for Racial Justice is a national organization and we have um, a network here in Ohio that we call Surge Ohio. Showing Up for Racial Justice actually started nationally about 10, a little over 10 years ago. Um, and it feels really wild to be where we are right now because Surge was started um, when the, uh, after, right after Obama was elected. And there was actually a really uh, an uptick in white supremacist organizing and far right organizing um, that has a lot to do with where we are today, honestly, with uh, the president that we currently have in office. Um, there was a really coordinated effort from folks really on the far right to have an influence in national and statewide um, governments. And so at that time, there was a call out that was like, what are white folks doing to organize a response to this uptick in white supremacy organizing that really is going to have a, a huge impact. And at the time, you know, a lot of the conversation around racism and racial justice in the United States was that well, we're post racial, we've elected a black president, racism is gone. And I, I think it's really obvious that, that that just wasn't the case. And so I'm grateful for the folks who had some some visionary um, perspective on, on kind of what was happening at that time, because I very much am grateful that that container was built uh, for where we are right now. And so we had 15 chapters all volunteer across the, the country um, when we originally started and we're at almost 200 chapters uh, now. And in Ohio, we've got a statewide network of groups and individuals who are working within the Showing Up for Racial Justice um, network. And the, the campaign that we're currently working on that I think is actually like in the dumpster fire that has been this year, 
the impact that we can have on our local elections and local governments um, are, is actually really tremendous. And to have a campaign, we've been focusing specifically on Hamilton County and working with a coalition um, called Operation Change Cincinnati that's led by Black women movement leaders and organizers who have been doing a bunch of work around the, the state as well as in Hamilton County to have impacts on the criminal legal system. And so uh, the campaign that we're currently working on um, is supporting their list of endorsements to organization led by folks who have had who have been directly impacted uh, by mass incarceration in Ohio. And we're, um, we're having, yeah, we're, we're working collaboratively with them to not only continue to build a, a powerful base uh, that can hold whoever is elected accountable, but we're actually advancing two candidates who would be just truly transformative and would allow us to create the conditions to win even, even bigger wins. So we're supporting Charmaine McGuffey, who's running for sheriff. Um, she is actually incredible. She was actually uh, fired by the current sheriff last year when she was working inside the jail because she witnessed uh, acts of excessive use of force from correctional officers and police officers around her. And she refused to stay silent about it. She went uh, and demanded that the Cincinnati Police Department and the Sheriff's Department hold these officers accountable for their behavior. And she worked adamantly to advance resources and services uh, in, in kind of in place of the cycle of just continuing to, to lock people up. Um, and because she was such an advocate, she actually got fired. And then she decided that she was going to not only sue the sheriff's department, but run for this man's job. And she uh, is she she ran against him in the primary, won by a landslide, and is um, is actually running against someone who would be have a tremendously negative impact on the criminal justice system in Hamilton County. Um, he yeah he's actually uh, already he would be the first. Uh, person, uh, first officer, um, to actually kill an unarmed person uh, and then still be elected to sheriff. So the Republican is running on ex building a new jail and expanding the beds. And the Democrat, Charmaine McGuffey, that Operation Change Cincy is in support of, would really would operate in a completely different fashion and would give us the ability to have some significant impacts. Uh, both the prosecutor and the current sheriff have worked collaboratively with ICE. Um, the prosecutor who's running uh, against the current prosecutor, Fanon Rucker, um, and Charmaine McGuffey have agreed to, you know, no, to not work with ICE, to work towards uh, um, uh, ending cash bail. There's just tremendous uh, impact uh, for, for people who are impacted by the criminal legal system that these candidates would have. So yeah, that's a really exciting campaign that we're working on. And then the um, Transforming Justice Network that does the, a lot of the decarceration statewide work is still working really diligently on the impacts of COVID on our um, prisons and jails and detention centers. Um, the biggest hotspots in the world have been within prison, jail, and detention center systems. And I know that that's a campaign you've worked on in Morrow County. Um, and the Transforming Justice Network is continuing to look at the impacts of COVID on jails. Thank you, Avery Martins. Now we're going to hear from Melissa Bertolo. And before she speaks, I just want to point out, so you might know what certified organic is, hopefully. Uh, hopefully you know what certified fair trade is. Um, but did you know that you can live in a certified welcoming community? Um, Melissa is with Welcoming America, and she's going to tell us a little bit about that and any current campaign she's working on. Great. Thanks, Lynn. Um, and thank you um, and to Ohio State and ABLE for organizing um, the conference the last four weeks um, and for inviting me to participate. Um, so again, I'm Melissa Bertolo. Um, I have been with Welcoming America um, for the past three years. We are um, a national nonprofit organization that works to advance immigrant inclusion and belonging um, across the country. And so we do this primarily through, um, we have a, a network membership. Um, and so we work with over 200 communities in the country, um, both community-based organizations as well as um, local governments. And I actually got into this um, role because previously I worked for the city of Dayton 
um, which I'm still um, based here. Um, and I was the welcome date and program coordinator with the city. And so in that role, I had the um, opportunity to really look at immigrant inclusion from a local government perspective and to really start thinking about what are the policies and practices that a local government needs to have so that newcomers um, not only are able to access resources, but are also able to engage um, and to be a part of um, the process of, of creating uh, the future for, for the city. Um, and so in that role, um, as Lynn mentioned, um, the Certified Welcoming Program uh, developed at Welcoming America. Um, so Welcoming America in our work with all of these local communities across the country, you know, welcoming really kind of became a buzzword, right? So we have all of these places that are beginning to say, oh, you know, yes, I'm welcoming, but what does that truly mean? Um, additionally, I think we've seen, you know, some other language being used um, such as a sanctuary city or um, some other things that don't necessarily have um, at like a, a true legal definition. Um, and so also our members at Welcoming America were saying, you know, we need a framework, we need to figure out a roadmap of like, how do we um, advance some of this work? So we came up with a welcoming standard at Welcoming America um, that outlines the practices and policies that a local community needs to have in place um, to be welcoming um, for immigrants and refugees um, in particular, um, and to really be thinking about that. So this standard, um, there's over a hundred different criteria in it. I don't wanna to get too in the weeds in it, but it looks at things from language access um, to equitable outcomes in education, um, to opportunities for business, um, and resources, um, financing, and so on. Um, and so with the city of Dayton, um, when I was still working there was when uh, Welcoming America launched the Certified Welcoming Program and um, Dayton became the first Certified Welcoming City in the United States, which I'm very proud of. Um, the certification is um, just for, for three years and part of it's really about thinking about how do we hold local governments accountable Right, and I love um, what Avery was saying as well, as far as um, you know that the there's so much importance around the local government, and I think that's what's really critical about certified welcoming. Um, I'm also really proud of the fact that um, Ohio has more places um, in the certification process than any other state. So go Ohio. Um, you know, I think sometimes it can be really hard and frustrating to be in this work, um, and yet you know, there's a lot of momentum and there's a lot of um, commitment, I think that we're seeing. So Dayton and Lucas County are both certified and then um, the city of Toledo and city of Cincinnati are both in the process of becoming certified. Um, and we have um, at this point, so the program's been around for about 10 years, or not 10 years, I'm sorry, <laughs> three years. Uh, Welcoming America has been around for 10 years. Um, but Certified Welcoming is a newer program, um, just really wrapping up its third year. Um, and we have 10 certified cities um, or counties, it's for cities or counties, and um, uh, about 20 more in the pipeline. Thank you, Melissa. And you can tell that this is a group of organizers because the chat is blowing up with all kinds of resource pages, ways to get involved, um, ways to get more information. So definitely check that out. Uh, we'll also send around, we have a link um, where Jolanda like collated a lot of these um, ways to get involved and stuff. So we will send that out as well. Um, next, we're going to hear from Mustafa Jamale. Um, Mustafa is in a really exciting new role at the Voice for Refuge Action Fund. And to my knowledge, it's the first political organization organized to advance refugee uh, candidates and to create or push candidates to be pro-refugee. And re a refugee is a very specific definition in immigration law, and it's a category that's been completely decimated by the Trump administration. It's also a, a group of people that are very important to Ohio, which has been the home for refugees for many years now. So Mustafa, tell us a little bit <laughs> more about wow. um, yourself, the organization, and what you're working on right now. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you guys so much for having me um, this morning. My name is Mustafa Jim Ali. I'm the new political director for Voice for Refuge Action Fund. Uh, Voice for Refuge 
has only really been around for a couple of months now, um, but a bunch of resettlement staffers that uh, work to resettle refugees at these various agencies have over the years kind of gotten really frustrated with the administration's just consistent attacks on immigrants and refugees. Over the past uh, four years, the Trump administration cut refugee resettlement by um, more than 80%. Just earlier this week, he decided that um, for the next fiscal year, that they're gonna only admit 15,000 refugees. And what that really means is that they're probably gonna admit 7,000. So, the real life like consequences of those kinds of decisions means that folks who have been up, been living abroad for like the past 10 plus years trying to get resettled um, have to wait longer. Um, their lives will be delayed. For some folks, they um, they may not even make it, you know, they may not survive. And so yeah, Voice for Refuge was created really to push back against this very racist and xenophobic narrative about refugees. Um, up until recently, uh, refugee issues weren't, wasn't really political. Um, both folks on the left and the right have been supporting refugees for quite some time. Um, Republicans have been very sympathetic, um, you know, since 1980. And so for us to be in this situation, it's just, it's unfortunate. And so at Works for Refuge, what we're now doing is that, you know, we're kind of, what we're doing is like empowering refugees. For a very long time, I think refugees have been in spaces where, you know, they get trained um, to do get trained to like get involved in their communities, or they get thrown out to DC to do advocacy on refugee policy. But they haven't been really, uh, in a significant way, really had a seat at the table. Okay, I'll speak louder. Um, is it better now? <clears throat> okay, cool. So the refugees really didn't did not have a seat at the table. And so um, as part of our mission, what we hope to do is really provide a lot of leadership opportunities for current refugees to get plugged in civically. Um, and, you know, um, like for refugees to join a commission at the city level, state level, you don't have to be an elected official. And so that's kind of our plan there, um, to provide them training on how to get plugged in in, in these different various um, opportunities. And then for former refugees, what we hope to do really is, especially for those who are interested in running for office, to train them and to provide them resources to run for office. We're supporting pro-refugee candidates and former refugees candidates who are running for office right now. Um, in a little bit, I, I can drop some links on the folks that we've endorsed, but we've endorsed 43 candidates who have, um, yeah, who have been doing a lot of great work in their communities and uh, we're really excited to see what happens next week. Um, aside from that, you know, we've been really uh, putting out a lot of messaging like um, specific to four different communities this election. So we're working in the Somali community, the Burmese community, um, the Nepalese community and the Arabic speaking community. And so we have folks in Pennsylvania and North Carolina and a lot of the work that we've been doing, uh, myself and those community organizers, has been uh, basically like coming up with targeted messaging for folks. There's a lot of people who have um, have absorbed a lot of misinformation, thinking that the Trump administration will give them a check um, if he wins. Some some folks are just plainly trying to close the door behind them, right? Not supporting. Um, other immigrants in their settlement efforts. Um, but yeah, so the community organizers have been out there in those communities organizing, doing phone banks, talking to religious leaders, really trying to push folks to support uh, Biden Harris. Um, yeah, and so it's gonna be it's gonna be a journey, you know, and next year we hope to um, actually, you know, run some folks against anti-refugee extremists like. There's a mayor in Springfield, Massachusetts that actually in, um, essentially like agreed to the president's ban of refugees. And so we hope to like find someone to challenge that mayor, you know, and really um, give refugees more agency. Um, so yeah, I can, I'll just stop it there. Thank you, Mustafa Jumale.
Oh, I'm, I'm echoing. And last, we're going to just get to meet for a minute and then we'll get into discussion. Monica Ramirez, she's with Farmworker um, or with uh, Justice for Migrant Women. And she's also launched a new campaign in Ohio called Essential Ohio. Uh, Monica is a long term advocate and labor organizer, um, very much focused on farm worker visibility. Um, we see the food that they produce, but we um, often don't see the people um, behind the food. Um, so Monica has been working to change that and to make sure that they are given the dignity and rights that they deserve. Monica, let us know a little bit about your organizations and a current campaign you're working on. Great. Thank you. It's really wonderful to be here and so inspiring to hear about all the wonderful work and important work that is happening. Um, I, you know, as Lynn said, I'm the founder of an organization called Justice for Migrant Women. And uh, Justice for Migrant Women focuses on the civil and human rights of migrant women workers, including farm worker women. Um, I come from a migrant farm worker family. I was born, raised, and live in Ohio. Um, my family settled out of the migrant stream, which is why we landed here in Ohio. And um, much of the work that I've done over the course of, of my career and the other organizations that I've co-founded have really been um, informed by the knowledge of the farm worker community that was really um, given to me by my family, by my parents in particular. And so what we know about farm workers and migrant workers in our country is that they are still experiencing many injustices and many of these workers are immigrants. Um, so the, the topics related to uh, immigrant community members, um, including immigration, but certainly not um, isolated to immigration are things that we work on through our work. Um, and one of the current campaigns that we're working on um, actually in collaboration uh, with Lynn and her organization and ABLE is um, a campaign called Essential Ohio. And um, that campaign is actually related to a national campaign on behalf of um, essential workers across our country. So we know that during this COVID crisis, essential workers, workers who've always been essential but have now just been recognized as essential, um, have been holding our country up. And many of those workers are immigrant workers who have been working as farm workers, domestic workers, restaurant workers, grocery workers, and the list goes on. And so this national campaign that was launched um, over Labor Day weekend focuses on um, not only ensuring that we are honoring the work of these workers, but that we're actually helping them win the essential rights and benefits that they've been denied for many, many years. Um, and so the Essential Ohio campaign is specifically focusing on essential workers here in our state. And um, the campaign really has three main focuses, which are um, getting policies passed that would be to the benefit of these workers. So including things like premium care and um, premium pay and uh, worker stand health and safety standards and anti-retaliation for whistleblowers and, and the ability to engage in collective bargaining. You know, things that seem pretty basic, but unfortunately don't extend to many of the workers who fall in, in this category of workers. So um, through policy initiatives, um, including here in the state of Ohio, local resolutions that we are, um, that we've seen passed in the last few weeks, which I can talk about in more detail in a little while. Um, we're also working on um, helping to get worker-led task force set up in different localities so that the, when these laws and resolutions or eventually the federal bill would be passed, there would actually be organizing power on the ground so workers can be part of the enforcement um, of the rights that are meant to extend to them. Um, and then lastly, a big part of the work relates to narrative. Like how are we talking about the immigrant workers who are in our state and their many contributions? Are we talking about them, right? In my opinion and through the work I've done, there are many false narratives that have been told about our communities. And so a big piece of this work is correcting those narratives and ensuring that the, the people themselves, the community members themselves get to write their own stories. So I'm happy to talk about all of it more and really pleased to be here with all of you. Thanks, Monica. I think something you brought up is really what we're trying to get at in this convening is like, what are the role of allies and what are the role of the people who are living the experience? and you know, some of us are trying to be allies, but we want to be very respectful of the role that people coming from the communities have. And I think Avery did a good job of sort of laying out how that's happening in the Hamilton County Sheriff's race. Um, I wanted to ask a little bit, of, I'm going to ask all the panelists now a few questions, and then we will get to the audience Q&A. One question I have for you all is, um, what 
is organizing. How would you explain that to your grandma if you if she said, "What are what do you do? What's an organizer? I don't get it." Um, how would you explain it? Who wants to jump in? I'll call on you if I need to. I'm happy to jump in quickly because I get that question all the time. <laughs> um, you know, in my opinion, organizing is about bringing people together around issues that we care about and figuring out how we can get people um, to build power together to work on those issues. Yeah, and what I would add to that is like also building um, real authentic relationships is, is really, building them and maintaining them is really important to that. Avery, what are your thoughts? Yeah, totally agree with what folks are saying. And, and I think of organizing as creating opportunities for folks to, um, to come together and, and build power and, um, and being able to, when I think of organizing as like a little different than activism, I think of it like activism as something that like one person does from their place and that organizing is something that we all do together. Oh, wow. I hope somebody wrote that down. <laughs> I would be tweeting that if I wasn't also doing this. Um, Melissa, maybe you could talk a little bit about it because you and I have talked about how your work is a little bit different than what some of the others on the call are doing. Um, so what is organizing to you? And if you could talk a little bit about any sort of unusual partnerships that you might have had to engage in in order to accomplish your goals. Yeah. Um, so I think, I mean, just one other aspect that I um, think is really important when I think about organizing and I guess particularly from, you know, about not being a community organizer and being, um, you know, typically I work with local governments um, is this idea around co-creation. Um, and so really thinking about how do we ensure that, um, you know, that the people power is what's, what's driving the decisions um, at, um, the, um, I guess like the political process um, or for, for some of these outcomes. Um, you know, when I think around the, the second part of the question that you asked Lynn about um, unusual partnerships, um, I think the other piece, you know, and again, from my like very <laughs> lens of, of local government here, um, but I really think around um, finding champions and particularly within, within organizing and really determining, you know, um, uh, some of those pieces around what is someone's motivation um, and making sure that there's a champion um, from, um, a, from, you know, where, where you're trying to, um, to make change. Um, and so, I mean, I would just say that I think within the work that we've done both with Welcome Dayton as well as Welcoming America, um, you know, for a while, and I, I don't think that this is as uncommon anymore, um, but for a while it really was around partnerships with Chambers of Commerce um, and really thinking about um, some of the economic factors um, and the um, pieces around um, uh, driving um, decisions there. Um, so I would say that's, um, you know, been um, one of the like ones in the past that I think seem to be a little bit more of an uncommon um, partner, but I don't, I don't see it as much anymore. I think that that's kind of like been more driven into the mainstream. Thanks, Melissa. Anna, any thoughts from you on unusual partnerships you've forged or dealt with or anything else about organizing? Yeah, I think that, um, so as I said before, I see organizing as being an educational project. I think there are lots of people in the community who are generally well disposed, um, are interested in justice and equality, um, but don't always understand exactly how that plays out in organizations that they're involved with. Um, and so one of the things that we do or that I've done um, working with the Buckeye Dream Ally Group is to map complex systems it's kind of a, a way of creating knowledge and creating understanding of what sorts of resources and barriers um, exist in our community um, for people who, um, who are undocumented. Um, and so one of the first hurdles is just figuring out what is out there, um, figuring out where people get tripped up, figuring out what really helps, and then getting that information into the hands of people who are actually in a position to work with students or to work with colleagues, to work with coworkers. Um, so yeah, I think that um, 
it's, it's not only working with a variety of constituents um, within the community, it's also thinking about um, knowledge production, right? It's also thinking about disseminating knowledge and educating people and making sure that they really understand and are prepared to engage um, in situations where knowledge is needed. Thank you. I think that a lot of people are organizers and don't realize it, don't apply that label to themselves. And I feel that sometimes it's about more of a personality, sort of like, I'm, I have a, there's a problem, I'm going to work with people to fix it and to keep finding, you know, the next, next avenue and the next thing to do. Um, so if that's true, and if you, if that resonates with you, anybody on the panel, I would love to hear about the first campaign you organized. Um, maybe you were in third grade and you didn't like the chicken nuggets at your cafeteria. <laughs> so, you, you know, does anybody have any examples of sort of the first, thinking back now that they understand their role as an organizer, what was the first campaign you, um, you led or you organized? Nobody? What? I can, I can do a share. I can do a share. Yeah, <laughs> you guys aren't shy. You're being polite. Go ahead. Um, yeah, I, so I was born in Cleveland. I grew up in Butler County, Ohio, Southwest Ohio. And uh, I was, I've been um, out as a queer person, gender non-conforming person, um, visibly since I was 12, officially since I was 15. And, and in uh, the high school that I went to, um, gender identity and expression and sexual, sexual orientation were not considered protected classes from discrimination. Um, and there are still no federal protections from discrimination for folks um, for, based on those categories. And so uh, at the time I was trying to get um, protection from harassment. Um, and I just was like, I was, <laughs> angry and and uh you know got some some students with me and we had some meetings and and demanded that uh gender identity and sexual orientation be added to our non-discrim protections um this was like 2001 and uh and we got it and uh it was yeah and i just thought i was just mad and demanding change and then later in life i learned oh god this is a thing that's like necessary in so many uh so many places and that um i have like a real a real passion and drive for it thank you avery anybody else monica i bet you i bet there's something in your past <laughs> yeah i mean <laughs> I, i've been organized it feels like i've been organizing forever um you know i guess probably the first um, real campaign that I worked on was also in high school. And, um, you know, as I said, I come from, I live in a rural community here in Ohio and um, had experienced, you know, a, um, a classmate, you know, call group of, of, of Mexican teens in my community, um, you know, some racist and terrible names. And that um, kind of, first of all, it was shocking to me. And also, it was a motivator to try to figure out how to to change it, to fix it. And so, um, I ended. I went to the school and I asked. I basically created a multicultural club. You know, it was a club at that point. And so, we organized the students to um, have. What ended up happening is we ended up having a day at the school each year that was focused on learning about different cultures and so we had a partnership with Finley University and, and their international students came and and they sort of mixed up the, the classes and, and different people had to attend different sessions and um, it was really it was really I think um, a good exercise because I had to learn to negotiate with the administration but I also you know there was a lot of pushback from the other students so I think probably that was like one of my first real experiences with trying to organize something and understanding I think, you know, to Anna's point earlier, understanding the importance of figuring out, you know, how to bring along, you know, figure out who your champions are and how to figure out how to bring them along with you um, in the process, because I definitely don't think that, that that campaign that I started at my high school would have happened, couldn't have happened had it not involved the administration of the school. That's awesome. Anybody else? Well, <clears throat> for me, the first political campaign I worked on um, was like with the Minnesota Democratic Party. And so myself, so that year they hired like four organizers from um, 
immigrant communities and they felt like they were very visionary, but we each were assigned to organize uh, like the Somali community or the Latinx community. But we're like one person, you know, for the entire state, they expect us to engage all these folks. So we were a little crazy, you know, ourselves and very motivated. And so we like drove around to all these rural places and, talk, you know, we would drive like for 45 minutes just to have a conversation with a couple of people in one neighborhood. Um, so it was, it was really, uh, it was interesting. It was my first time talking to people about their, what, what like is um, important to them, what policy issues, what's going on in their community. Um, it was terrible in the sense that they actually just hired us to hire us and take pictures. They didn't really hire us to organize those communities because they didn't provide any resources to us. And so we did what we could do and like we built relationships. Um, but yeah, I, I uh, never worked on a political campaign again. Wow. <laughs> so, aside from like volunteering on one these days, yeah. Let's let's explore that a little bit. This like, sort of the tokenism and like we're gonna check off the box because we hired Mustafa. Um, mm -hmm. Do other people have other people felt that? And also, how do you overcome that? Like, how do you how do systems do better? Do you have any examples in your work? I think like when organizations actually really center those communities and people who are directly impacted, not only does the work get better but it's um, more long-term, I would say, it's like more sustainable. Um, I've seen that happen, um, yeah, in, in some organizations. Um, another way to do that is just to open your own organization. <laughs> so a lot of like us end up doing that, opening a club or a nonprofit and organizing our people and getting our own money. We have a lot of that in Ohio. Um, anybody else have thoughts on this? This is, I think this is super important. Yeah, you know, I actually, um, without naming any names, I, as an attorney, had an experience, because I'm an attorney also, I had an experience where you know, I was the first Latina attorney to ever be hired to work with this particular organization, the only Latina um, to work um, there. And, and so I kept being um, called out in a way from my work to, to meet with all sorts of people, visitors, donors, like all sorts of people. And, and it was just constantly happening. And so um, I think that when, when we work for nonprofit organizations, um, sometimes it feels difficult to challenge those sorts of things. And I, and particularly when, um, you know, part of the mission of the organization is to um, you know, to fight for equality or to, you know, fight against discrimination or those sorts of things. It feels difficult to push back, but I think it's really important to push back. And, and in that situation, I actually went to my supervisor and said, listen, I'm being asked to have all of these meetings, um, you know, I'm, I'm, because I'm the Latina. And so I keep being asked to go talk to people and, because I'm the Latina, but that means I can't do my work. So I'm still being assigned just as much work as everyone else, but I, I keep being interrupted. And um, it really needs to be shared work. And so, uh, you know, they took it very seriously and they changed it. But, but I, I feel like sometimes it's, it's, it's difficult to feel like we can challenge things like that. And I think certainly when we're working for justice oriented organizations, we definitely should because it goes against the mission of the work that we're trying to do. So true. Anybody else have to add? I mean, this is really, really a good discussion. I mean, I'd actually be really curious about like um, from from Avery or Serge's, um, you know, work, um, because I think that's such a, a really important part of being a white ally and like what does it mean to disrupt and dismantle these systems that perpetuate that aspect. Um, and I can just share like one of the things that I've been really focused on in my life as far as thinking about like where am I volunteering. Um, and spending my time is making sure that like the places that like either I'm donating money to or I'm volunteering my time with um, are immigrant led or are led by people of color. Um, because I think, you know, back to Mustafa's point, like, you know, like uh, hopefully it's not that the system like drives people out, but really looking at like, how do we lift up these organizations that are, that um, are centered around the experiences of the people impacted. So just um, kind of curious, Avery, about you know what Surge has done in that in that field as well. Oh, 
Oh my goodness. Yeah, this is such an important topic because when we're, uh, you know, in organizations that um, have missions and values that are for equity and justice, and we only see that work as being external, uh, we cause all sorts of harm. And, you know, institutional racism, institutional, like these are, these are, these are baked into all institutions within the United States, right? And that even means our nonprofit um, and social service organizations uh, were created in this, like, in this context, right, of explicit and overt white supremacy and racism that is just baked into all aspects of, of our institutions and our systems. And so, um, you know, it's like, oh gosh, what is that thing? Um, white supremacy isn't the shark, it's the water we're all swimming in. But like, it's not this thing that is necessarily external to us. It's like, the, you know, yeah, it's this cultural stew of 400 years of policies and systems and practices and ideologies that perpetuate, even in our most, uh, you know, well-intentioned organizations, um, it perpetuates a lot of oppression. And so, this is an amazing toolkit that I just wanted to share that I put in the chat from racialequitytools.org. They host it. It's um, actually from, um, I think it's, uh, okay, this uh, this packet is Safe Alliances Housing or Safe Houses, Safe House Alliance.org. But um, there's a whole, there's a whole host of resources very similar to this of how do we make sure that our organizations are aligned with our values internally. Um, and that means that folks who are making decisions, um, you know, that there's diversity and equity at all levels of the organization. That means, you know, from the board to who's making decisions, who's in power, how are decisions made. And this, this uh, resource really helps walk people and organizations um, through that process. That's great. Thank you for posting that. I'm going to lift up a, a comment from the chat. Um, Jose says, yes, there are still moments in which the invitation to be present in an organization is felt to be only the poster boy or to allow the organization to be able to check a box as having one on the roster. Um, that's, that's very real. Um, we could spend, a, you know, we should probably do a whole other panel on this and I'm not trying to cut the conversation off. Um, I just wanted to acknowledge that because I think everybody on this, uh, on this team has a lot of thoughts on that. Uh, sort of a tangential issue I want to talk about is about language, because I noticed Avery, when, when they were talking about um, their work, they said um, the criminal legal system, not the criminal justice system. And to me, that really was like, I noticed that because it's not justice. It's not just right now. It's, it may be a legal system, but it's corrupt and broken. So I would love it if, if others, and you know, welcoming America is a very deliberate language choice. Um, if, if others on the panel could talk about a deliberate language choice you've made in your work and why. So as a, as a linguist, I probably have a leg up on this topic. Um, I think that's a that's a great question, and the way that we talk about things matters so much because it really does change um, the way that we think about issues or we think about people. Um, one of the examples that we use in our ally trainings um, is thinking about words that may be technically correct but can be understood um, to be um, disrespectful or dehumanizing. Um, so. As a white woman, um, one word that might be technically correct to apply to me would be female. Um, but that's the kind of a word that you might hear like in a doctor's office, right? Or in a medical report. And if somebody said, oh, did you see what that female said in the panel today? They probably mean something negative by it. Um, and so when we're thinking about other word uses, I think the, the classic one is talking about people who are undocumented. Um, and using words like alien or criminal or illegal, um, when those kinds of words are not used for people who are in violation of other laws, even people who do something very serious, um, you know, thinking about people who commit murder, who commit rape, we generally don't talk about them as illegal. Um, so I think that um, just thinking about the way that we use language, and, and that's a great example that you guys brought up, um, is, is so important both in terms of things that we think about often and that are kind of high um, in our consciousness and awareness um, and in terms of things that um, are 
that cause us to, to think twice or to question ourselves or to be like, oh, wait a minute, you know, why did they use that term? Anyone else have thoughts on language? Okay, well, let's move into some audience Q&A. And I just want to point out Mustafa's got a hard stop at 11. So if you have particular questions for him, definitely put them in the Q&A or, um, or shoot them over and we can try to get them um, answered later. So the first question is for Melissa. It says, if your program started 10 years ago during Obama administration, what was your motivation to start the program? So talking about welcoming USA. Yeah, Welcoming America um, actually drew um, out, grew out of um, an anti-immigrant um, campaign, actually, um, in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, there was um, some work being done around an English-only ordinance. And um, the founder of Welcoming America um, was working for Turk at that time, which is Tennessee Immigrant Rights and Refugee um, Coalition. And really starting to think about um, the work of um, immigrant inclusion around thinking about um, kind of what we consider sometimes a, like a receiving community um, or those of us who've been here for a longer amount of time and really thinking about the need for bridging um, and in order to change, you know, negative um, reactions um, and, you know, something like um, an English only ordinance um, to really start thinking about how do we provide more opportunities um, and, and really focusing on, you know, like social contact theory of, of understanding that people who have um, experiences, relationships, et cetera, with people um, who are different than them, um, you know, tend to be more open to, um, to other people. Um, and so that's really where the work grew out of um, at that time. Um, certified welcoming specifically, which also was created during the Obama administration. No, um, I guess it was not created during the Obama administration, technically. So it started during the Obama administration. It was launched during the Trump administration. Um, so, um, but that program was really developed around um, listening to our members um, that we needed to have um, a benchmark for what does it mean to be welcoming? Um, how do we hold communities accountable that claim to be welcoming? Um, and then how do we have this pathway um, or roadmap for um, places that are like, you know, thinking about just getting started in this work um, and really finding um, that opportunity. So that's a little bit of the history there. Thanks, Melissa. Um, this is a great question. I want to jump to um, from Shana King or Kling. What will change about your organizations and their efforts based on the different outcomes of election day? Is Trump actually following through on all of these extreme policies that he states on social media or in press conferences? Scenario planning. I know you've been doing it. You're maybe trying to avoid it, <laughs> but anybody have some thoughts on how the outcome might shift your, your work? I think for us, you know, for us, if, if Trump uh, loses, it's a, it would be a great thing because then we can work on re, uh, reestablishing the refugee resettlement program, you know, which will take quite some time. I guess our work then would shift to like, um, would be uh, would shift to like pushing Biden to actually um, do what he said he was going to do, and so um, and I think if he loses, I mean if he wins, if Trump wins, then you know we continue organizing and building regardless either way, but like working towards that goal of of restoring the resettlement program. Yeah. Um, I think also a lot of us are thinking about what the funders are going to do. You know. Like if Biden wins, I feel like there's going to be a, a drop in immigration uh, um, funding for Im immigrant rights organizations. Um, so. That would be scary. <laughs> we have so much yeah. work to do. Yeah. And anybody else have thoughts on, um, you know, the work for your organizations, depending on the outcome of next week? Yeah, I mean, my, my first response is to say nothing changes. We still have so much work to do. Um, but I think the possible outcomes range from cautiously optimistic to really, really terrible. I know that one of the things that we're thinking a lot about in higher education is our international students. Um, and a lot of times the line between being undocumented and having a student visa is very, very thin. 
Um, and so definitely we'll be looking at what kinds of education policy and education advocacy um, we can we can work on moving forward. I think there's definitely a lot. Uh, so the Trump administration has made it very clear that they are hostile um, to higher education and also to immigrants and refugees in general. Um, and so uh, it, that that would be a very discouraging scenario. Um, All right. You know, yeah, go for it. Because I think that, you know, for a lot of the communities that we are from and that we serve, um, it's, you know, for, for our work, we think about the fact that our community has been um, denied basic rights, um, dignity, humanity, and safety for decades. It's not just one administration that has done this. And um, and the work that we do, you know, our, we just have to continue planning to push back against whoever is in office because we've never had what we need. Our communities have never had what they need. And so we have to be prepared to continue to push and fight for what our communities have always needed and been denied. And, and it's at all levels of government. It isn't only the presidential um, candidate or whoever you know wins, um, who, whoever is elected president. It's, it's at all levels of government. We need local politicians to do right by our communities, state level as well, members of the Congress. So I just feel as though, um, you know, we of course will, we have to remain nimble, we have to remain flexible, we have to be ready for whatever is going to come our way. And that is the exercise and work of an organizer to stay nimble. Uh, but the truth is, we're trying to win battles that we've been fighting for decades. Wow, I am tweeting this while you're talking, because that was awesome. We, our communities have never had what they need. That's like a, a like a decades long, you know, centuries long thing. Thank you, Monica. I just um, jump yeah, in. Yeah, go ahead. And just, sure. I think there was a second part to that question around um, whether Trump is really following through on um, the I forget what it was something like um, you know his extreme policies, um, and I just want to make it really clear that he is following through on his extreme policies. I mean, I think we've really seen that. Um, through so many different things, um, you know, the Muslim ban, the decrease in um, refugee uh, resettlement to an all-time low, um, the essential, um, just how incredibly hard it is to get asylum, um, it, the separation of children um, from their from their families, um, and the fact you know that there's still parents who um, are not reconnected um, with their children. Um, so I just want to, you know, be very clear about that. And I, and I think the other thing is, I mean, quite honestly, um, Stephen Miller, who is Trump's advisor on immigration, um, has some really, really extreme views. And I read a really interesting article recently about how, um, you know, if Trump does win a second president or a second term, um, that um, there is it's very likely that some of these things that are like just too extreme for a first term president will come through. So things like taking away something like birthright citizenship um, could be on the table. Um, and so, you know, I just do wanna like mention that, like, I think that um, the administration is um, uh, terrifying, <laughs> just to say that, you know, I see some people commenting in the, in the oh, it's Anna in the chat, right about DACA as well, temporary protected status um, all across the board. I mean, these are all things that, I mean, we've just really seen our immigration system be cut. Um, it, you know, it's just been really, really challenging time. Um, and there's gonna be a lot of work to do no matter what happens. Um, so. There's a, there's a question in the chat or in the Q&A that um, is jumping off of all this stuff. And it's actually similar to a question that I wanted to ask panelists. So the questioner says, it seems like every day in the past four years brings a new horror story. How do we get these incredibly important messages to break through the burnout everyone is experiencing and resonate? So that's a, I think that question is asking about communications and how to, you know, strategy on communications. But the question I wanted to add onto it for the panel is, as an organizer, as a person who lives in a community that as a person who's talks to people whose lives are um you know in the balance and being voted on um 
how do you avoid burnout for yourself? Um, and I know that's a big topic, um, but are there things that you can recommend to others about how to stay um, healthy mentally? Um, so this is this is something that I um, deal a lot with um, as someone who works with students and, and students who are politically active. Um, it is really hard. Um, there are so many things that um, need attention. And I think that it's really important to have priorities. Um, for me, my first priority is my family and my kids. And if I feel like we're doing okay, then I have the energy to move on and do some other stuff. Um, if my family, my mental health, my kids' health is not doing okay, then I know that I need to take a break, let somebody else step out in front for a while. Um, but once, once you're in that place where you do feel like you have some energy and you have some ability to, to, to give and to be involved, um, I think you need to really look for things that, that give energy back to you, right? So you're not always spending. Um, for me, I love one-on-one -on -one conversations. That's one of the reasons that I got involved with Ohio Immigrant Visitation is because we do one-on-one -on -one meetings with people who are incarcerated because of immigration issues. And that is fun. I love it. I love talking to people. Um, even though the overall situation is incredibly depressing, um, I usually would walk out of Morrow County Jail feeling energized um, because when you look at somebody and you have a personal connection with them. For me, that's something that really makes me feel like it's worthwhile um, to be doing this. So I think that may be different for every person, right? What makes me happy is not gonna make anybody else on this panel happy necessarily, but you have to find that thing um, that really keeps you energized and keeps you moving. I feel you on Morrow County. <laughs> anybody else have examples or tips? Cause I think everybody feels this, whether you're an organizer or not, if you, if you're alive and you're reading the news, you're you're taking this in. Yeah, you know, I I um, you know, I have a therapist, and I and I th and I say that loudly and proudly because I don't think we talk about that enough, and and many of us struggle, you know, with everything that's going on in the world, and you know, so I have a therapist, and I'm really um, fortunate that I have um, health benefits that allow me to see a counselor. Um, but it's really important for me to be able to sustain myself in the work um, because we are managing um, a lot of really difficult topics every single day. You know, we are, um, my area of expertise is actually on sexual violence against um, farm worker and immigrant women. And that is a particularly difficult topic, as you all know. And so it's very important to, be, for, to have a professional who's available to help me when I need help. And um, the other is I have a very close circle of friends. Um, and a very, and my family is very, um, you know, very much part of my life every day. You know, I, I see my parents, I think every single day. And so um, that's what, the, what I need. But I think that to Anna's point related to the one-on-one -on -one conversations um, and to the other part of the question, which was about the breakthroughs, I think that what we've seen um, in the past uh, few years is that some of the biggest breakthroughs have happened because they've been generated through personal narrative, right? When you think about um, the Me Too movement, when you think about some of the other um, major movements um, that have really broken through in, in a major way, it's been because people have told their own stories. And as those stories have then been multiplied, um, that has helped to create some of the shifts that have been necessary. So I think that the more we can elevate some of those personal stories, um, that gives us the possibility for breaking through and, and hopefully also changing hearts and minds. That's really useful. Anybody else? We're getting some good questions in the chat. I'm going to try to get into all of them if possible. Um, so don't worry if, you're, if your question hasn't been discussed yet. Uh, one question says, I know lots of immigrants don't have the voting privilege, but they are also excluded from civic belongings. Why or how do we get immigrants involved in election discussion? At least let people who have the voting rights to hear immigrants' voice. Um, I, I've seen some, some really cool work happening in Ohio um, with immigrants, whether they can vote or not, um, sort of doing civic education, census education, et cetera. Do people have examples that they like to lift up or any thoughts on how to make this a, a broader trend? Uh, 
Um, okay, I see Monica is going to have to top off in a minute. Um, well, one one area I wanted to point to is um, African immigrants in Columbus. I think um, I work more close, most closely with the Mauritanian leaders, and I think that's a group you should definitely look to for some examples about how they get civically engaged. Um, they've done a lot of promotion around the census to get their community to participate. Um, they've also, they're also conducting their own census, which I think is so cool because they know they're going to be undercounted um, and they know that the power is in numbers. So they um, have advertised their own census as well to get a handle on the numbers of people from Mauritania who live in Ohio and who, so that they can communicate with um, certainty how large the, their community is. So I think those are a couple of cool examples. Happy to... Um, to give other examples um, to people offline if they want to get in touch. Also check out WOSU Paige Fledger. She's been, um, she's profiling some of these, these examples as well. I am gonna have to hop off, but I just wanted to mention, so our organization does work on civic engagement as well, particularly focused on BIPOC folks in rural America. And, um, you know, I think it's important for us to tell people that civic engagement is not just voting. Voting is certainly really important, but, and we want everyone to vote who is eligible to vote, but we also want people to know that if they aren't eligible to vote for whatever reason, um, that they talk to other people about why it's important to vote. And you know, we've seen campaigns where people are saying, "Vote for me," you know, "Vote on my behalf because I can't help," or tell three people, uh, remind three people to vote, or have you, you know, encourage your friends and family. Um, to, to get out and vote. So there are, I think, other ways, and you know, we, we know that there are immigrant community members who may not be eligible to vote, but then maybe they're doing some of the texting to remind people to vote, or they're making phone calls. And so, and that was around the census too. So there are definitely other ways that people can get engaged and, and hopefully all of our organizations are providing those kinds of tools. And I'm happy to share afterwards some of the tools that we're, we've created on our rural civic engagement. So thank you all so much. Thank you, Monica. Check out, um... My, uh, Justice for Migrant Women's website, they have great tools there. Um, I'm gonna combine a last two couple of the questions and then we have one closeout question for the panelists. I also wanna remind you to fill out the evaluation form. We dropped it in the chat um, and we will put you in a drawing to win a gift card. So you have extra incentive to fill out the evaluation form. Um, so there's two questions that are I wanna relate together. Um, the first one says, what are your thoughts on Trump's criminal reform that he talks about? And when, what I want to relate that to is um, also the tokenism of um, 50 Cent and Ice Cube and Lil Wayne um, being used by the Trump administration to say that he's good on criminal, um, just criminal legal reform issues and other issues. So what are your thoughts on, does Trump have a plan? Is he serious or not? And what do you, what do you think about that? And then secondly, the second question is how does white saviorism show up in your work I think about the phrase, the path to hell is paved with good intentions. Have you come across good intentions with, with harmful results in your work? And in some ways I feel like white, white saviorism and tokenism of people of color and other minorities are sort of like two sides of the same coin. Um, and it's something that I, I definitely grapple with and make sure I try to you know, make sure I'm correcting myself to the extent possible. I'm sure I've failed many times. Um, but it's a, these are real issues that we have to deal with if we're organizing for progressive change and racial justice. So do people have thoughts on either or both of those questions? So I've, I've been jumping in on a lot of these, so I wanna pass the ball to either Avery or Melissa. Do you guys have thoughts on this? Um, uh, the white saviorism question, um, I think is, um, a really important one. Um, I think it's, um, I don't remember exactly what it is now. I apologize. How does it show up in our work? Right. Um, you know, I think, um, I forget who it was previously that spoke around narrative shift and, um, culture change. And I think that's, you know, in, in the conversation that was held previously around language is really important about it in this whole context as well. Um, because I think sometimes what the, the narrative, particularly from media, but then would also get perpetuated in smaller circles, 
around immigrant um, inclusion is like, you know, immigrants need something, they don't have something to give, but like, let me come here and help, particularly I think in, in, in refugee resettlement work, this um, is often apparent. And so I think it's really recognizing um, immigrant integration as a two way street, um, that there are, you know, opportunities um, for um, both, both to give, but also to, you know, as a white person to really receive. Um, and that um, I think the other piece is really around um, recognizing and valuing um, immigrant and refugee experiences um, and, and, and centering um, those in the work. Um, I was on a different um, webinar yesterday, but the conversation um, was around emergency management. Um, and, and how do we have inclusive emergency management? And, you know, one of the things that was really um, spoken about was just, you know, recognizing someone's lived experience as um, ex like professional experience as well. And how do you then use that? And how do you um, honor that? How do you pay someone for those types of things that you're continuing to ask them to do? So I think particularly in our work, um, we, um, you know, go often to the same community leaders over and over again and ask them to assist with outreach and education and, and all of these different um, pieces because they're the trusted um, leaders. And um, so how do we make sure that we're paying them for their time? How do we go beyond um, just recognition um, of, of them, but really um, lifting them up as um, as um, the piece there. So I don't know, I, was, I think I, I was really rambling there in my response. <laughs> no, that, that was great. Um, I'm really glad you mentioned that about paying people for their contributions. It's got to be a culture change. And I know that nonprofits are always, you know, we don't have any money, we don't have any money. If you're building like an ad campaign around somebody, or if you're, you know, if you're, if you're using their image, um, whether they're, they're the artist or the person you're taking the picture of or whatever, you know, you have to pay them just like you would pay your web host and your, um, you know, lobbyist or whatever. So I think you brought up a really good point. Avery, do you have any thoughts on this? Either um, Trump's criminal legal reform um, and also the white, the, uh, the white saviorism problem. And maybe you could even explain what that is. I'm not sure if everybody understands exactly what, what we're talking about with white saviorism. Totally. Yeah, I wanted to share a couple of resources and, and some thoughts on this for sure. So um, thinking about like this idea of um, tokenism, uh, about how like culture, culture's role in a lot of this, um, there's this really helpful uh, resource put out by this woman, her name is Tenna Oaken. Um, it's actually from, uh, I think, one of the resources I shared earlier on, like, what are the, what is white supremacy culture? What do we mean when we, when we talk about um, how oppressive, dominant cultural norms, like, show up in our, in our everyday work? Um, and then I also kind of want to kind of also talk a little bit about, like, why Surge was created, was, uh, has a lot to do with this idea of, like, what is white people's role in movements for racial justice? Um, and we see ourselves as kind of answering a call that's been made of uh, black and brown organizers for over 60 years, which is very much like, thank you so much white people for showing up and like registering people to vote in black and brown neighborhoods and doing all this work. But actually what would be strategically most like impactful is if white folks started addressing the ways that racism and white supremacy are upheld within the communities that we are directly uh, connected to. And so that's really, I, I, is it okay if I screen share for just a second? Oh, I love it. Oh, the host is able to participate in screen share. Oh, sorry. Makes sense. Um, no. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, we know why. Okay. <laughs> yeah, totally fair. It's a wild time to be alive. So I'm just going to share um, I'm just going to share this. And this is a, 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 a slide show that we use in some trainings with Surge um, nationally as well as locally. But there's a quote in here from a ton of different movement organizers uh, across ge many generations. There's one that I'm just going to read from Malcolm X. And he says, 
where the really sincere white people have got to do their proving of themselves is not among the black victims, but on the battle lines of where America's racism really is. And that's in their own home communities. America's racism is among their fellow whites. That's where sincere whites who really mean to accomplish something have got to work. There's another one, Darnell Moore, um, an incredible organizer. He says, the real liberatory and radical work begins at home, literally. Black people don't need to be convinced that anti-racism, structural, oh, I'm sorry, that anti-black racism, structural inequity and skin privilege are facts. White people do. White people have to do the hard work of figuring out the best ways to educate themselves and each other about racism. And he goes on to say, and I don't know what that looks like because that's not my work or the work of other black people to figure out. In fact, the demands placed on black people to essentially teach white folks how not to be racist or complicit in structural racism is itself an exercise of willful ignorance and laziness. And that's a pretty, it's a bold statement, but it's very, it's just very real. Um, oh, thank you. I see that I can screen share now. It's, it's totally okay. Everyone's got the link. Um, <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. But yeah, that's just like a big part of what we see our work in Surge as, and we kind of have this idea of, of change, like our theory of change is around personal transformation and collective action. And that as white folks, we, we, are, we live in a culture of white, we, we, our brains are like marinating all of us in a, in a cultural stew of white supremacy. And we have some personal work to do to show, to, to deal with how that shows up and who and how we are and how we do our work. And we also have this responsibility to be part of collective movements for liberation that are following the leadership of those who are most impacted. So similar, like what we do with Surge, like um, for example, the campaign we're working on in Hamilton County, uh, we are following the lead of black women organizers and activists who have been directly impacted, who have created a coalition and who have said, these are the candidates that will have a tremendous impact now, Surge, do y'all do your all's part of holding phone banks, calling white voters, getting them to show up uh, and voting in alignment with our values and visions. And so, yeah, that's this question is huge, and and Surge sees itself as part of you know a, a larger ecosystem, um, and we work uh, collaboratively all the time with organizers and leaders of color. And there's very important work that we white folks have to do to unlearn some of our socialization. And it's real harmful to ask people of color to hold that space for us. So our work, you know, in Surge is in service of us showing up and being less damaging and less harmful and actually more just productive in our, in our work. And so, yeah, this is just a, a huge topic and I appreciate the space to talk about it. It's so yeah, I, moving, it's like moving to me, yeah, go ahead. I love that, thank you for those comments, Avery. Um, I, I think it's also um, important to use our privilege. Um, I love being a middle-aged white woman. Um, I am expected to be nosy, I am expected to be pushy, I am expected to butt into places where I don't belong, um, and that's so useful. Um, I was um, walking around an event where people had told us that we weren't supposed to be in a certain space and I just walked into it and a younger um, co-worker who's younger and also a person of color said to me, you know, you're not supposed to be here, they're going to kick you out. And I was like, no, they're not going to kick me out because they're going to look at me and they're going to assume that I have a right to be there or if not, I'm going to make a big deal about it. Um, so that's the place where it's useful then the line is you don't want to take that persona into advocacy context because our role is to follow. Um, and so I think it is always something that we have to keep in mind and keep first and foremost, um, that we are here to encourage, to support, and to be resources um, for the people who are affected by systemic violence. Um, and I have found a lot of joy in taking the role of following um, activists who are younger, who are undocumented, who are immigrants, who are people of color, and who understand deeply the issues that they're facing in a, in a way that I think um, we have to do a lot of education as white people to understand exactly what's happening. Um, and one of the things that I've learned through this work is that it is the material support that counts for the most, right? So symbolic support is nice, but where is the funding? Where are the promotions? Where is the space to speak? Um, we can't just be like symbolic support. We have to be constantly working against the power systems and also in the power systems to make space for the people who, 
who should be leading? Um, I just want to mention, so I do some work with immigrants that are detained in jails, just like many people on this call. And this is an area I really, really struggle with because um, the bravery that I see from people that are, their, their power is trying to be taken away by putting them in jail and a jumpsuit and limitations on their freedoms and everything. Um, but then they still organize themselves. They still organize people on the outside to legally support them. Um, they organize their families to, um, you know, even internationally to get them money so that they can, you know, just have basic necessities in the jail is so profound, but it's dangerous sometimes for, for them to be public and speak about that. Um, so sometimes I feel like I have to be a conduit because if, um, if I'm not, then nobody will know what's going on. And the biggest example is when Morrow County Jail became 100% COVID positive, um, you know, people were sick. They couldn't be the ones speaking. Um, but, you know, just the way I struggle with it or the way I deal with it is to grapple with it all the time and say, you know, like, make sure I'm not looking like I'm the one saving people in the jail. I want people to know that the the people in the jail are the ones who are telling me what to do and asking me, you know, to do something. So I don't know if I've done it really well, but I'm, I'm struggling with it. And, I'm, you know, I think that's the best I can, I can offer right now. Um, so I'm just like a little bit really, that's really on my mind a lot. We're, we're coming up to 1130 and um, I want to make sure we get this last question in before everybody has to jump. We also, I would just want to remind people to fill out the evaluation. Um, thank you so much. So um, the closing question, and at this point we have Anna, Melissa, and Avery, and I can I can do part for Essential Ohio, Ohio since Monica's gone, but the closing question is, um, okay, we told people that if they got on this webinar that they would leave with concrete things they could do. So could you give somebody one specific thing they can do that relates to your, or your campaign's mission or goals? Um, and yeah. Just one concrete thing people can do. We would we'll start. Love, yeah, go ahead. Oh, sorry. <laughs> we would love for folks to join us uh, on our phone banks. We have phone banks every day up, uh, from now until the election in Hamilton County, campaigning for Charmaine McGuffey and Fanon Rucker for sheriff and prosecutor. Um, them being elected would be transformative, um, and it would be one step of many. Um, so I'll put a link to that in the pay or in the chat. Yeah, we'd love to have you join us uh, for phone banks. Great, thanks, Avery. Who's next? I'll go. I, my suggestion is to reach out to your local representative, um, whether that like local government, as in like city council, city commissioner type person. Um, and ask them um, what are they doing um, to be more welcoming and inclusive. Um, and if they say uh, we're not really sure, um, you could refer them to Welcoming America. Um, another really easy piece that I think is incredibly important is around language access. Um, and so making sure that um, local governments have contracts um, with interpreters and translators in place um, to make sure that people are able to access those resources of their local government. Thanks, Melissa. Anna? Um, so I, I just put the link to the DACA fund, fund at OSU up again in the chat. Um, we do have a student organization. Um, when I say we're here to follow, that is who we're following, um, our undocumented student organization. They're doing amazing work. They are working with the OSU administration right now um, in order to get more resources. Um, specifically, they have asked for a dedicated um, staff role to assist them in navigating the university. Um, so any support that you can give to them would be wonderful. That's great. Thank you. Concrete. Um, for Essential Ohio, um, one call to action for everybody is to get your city or municipality to introduce and pass a, an Essential Worker Bill of Rights. It's a resolution that um, is a statement of values about all workers um, needing access to you know, fair pay, not minimum pay, healthcare, 
affordable child care, labor rights, regardless of status. Um, and the goal is to get many cities across Ohio to pass these resolutions as a strategy to build um, commitments to pushing for changes in state and federal law. And we're serious about this. When Monica Ramirez is in, involved in something, it's serious. Um, Ohio has lagged behind on worker protections. Um, we have some of the worst um, labor trafficking and um, slavery-like conditions for workers in meatpacking and other factories and, and farm workers. So we've got a lot of ground to make up. We've got 1940s type conditions. Um, so if you can get your city to pass this resolution, it's the first step. Um, the way to connect with us is on our Twitter, go to Essential Ohio or Essential OH, send us a message and then we can um, get you the language. Um, you can also look on our Twitter. We've got examples from Dayton, Toledo, Lakewood and Columbus that have already passed. So with that, let me just um, make sure there's no more unanswered questions or comments in the chats to deal with. Um, okay. Um, somebody said we lost the original links in the chat before the last segment. Um, Jolanda, I'll work with you to figure out how we make sure we save all these links. Um, she says we can share a transcript. Um, and just, you know, I just want to close by saying um, to thank you to everybody, but especially, most especially, huge shout out to Maria Otero with Advocates for Basic Legal Equality and Jolanda Cepeda with Ohio State University Office of Diversity and Inclusion. Um, they made this conference come together and be possible, and they also delegated to the rest of us to um, be able to show up in our, and, and offer our own insights and advice. So thank you guys so much. Um, look forward to continuing to work with everybody and um, share these recordings with your network so we can continue to spread the message. Thanks everybody. Bye.